As we continue our study of cell energy, we're now going to focus on photosynthesis. So as an introduction, remember that, that there are certain kinds of organisms like plants and algae and some kinds of prokaryotes that are able to do photosynthesis to use the light energy from the sun to, and convert it to chemical energy and then use that energy um, to store it in sugars that are made from carbon dioxide and water. We can use this in a number of different ways. Of course, we can, we can have provide algae farms that we can produce oil for biodiesel or carbohydrates to make ethanol that can be used for fuel. Um, remember that autotrophs are the organisms that make their own food. That's going to be like plants and algae and so forth. The food they make is for their own purposes to sustain their life, and they usually do not consume organic molecules from other organisms. There are a few exceptions to this, but not too many. And by and large, photosynthesis is the source of their nutrition. Photoautotrophs, the photo part means light, okay, they use the energy of light to make their organic molecules. These are like plants and algae and other kinds of photosynthetic organisms. There are also organisms called chemoautotrophs that are certain prokaryotes that use inorganic chemicals like hydrogen sulfide and things like that as an energy source. Heterotrophs are consumers that feed on plants or animals or decompose organic material. So plants are photoautotrophs, animals are heterotrophs, and certain kinds of bacteria are chemoautotrophs. In plants, photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast, which is found in the leaf, and the process of photosynthesis converts carbon dioxide and water into organic molecules like sugar and release oxygen as a byproduct. So all different kinds of plants, from trees and uh, flowering plants on the ground, to algae, protista of various kinds, seaweed, all of these different kinds of, of uh, autotrophs use photosynthesis to make food. It does occur in the chloroplast in the plant cells. These are the sites, the major sites of photosynthesis. And the, one of the main things that's in chloroplast is something called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a pigment. A pigment is a substance that absorbs light in certain wavelengths. And the chlorophyll that's found in chloroplast is why plants are green. Um, chlorophyll is the uh, one of the main things in the plant, in the chloroplast, that is able to help convert solar energy to chemical energy. They are found mostly in the cells of the mesophyll, which is the green tissue in the interior of the leaf. Leaves have a number of different structures, which we'll talk about in class, and there are um, several things that we need to be concerned about with our discussion of photosynthesis, one of which is the stomata. The stomata are tiny pores in the leaf that allow carbon dioxide to enter and oxygen and water vapor to exit the leaf. There are veins in the leaf, of course, that deliver water that's absorbed by the roots and also carry away the food that is made in the mesophyll. Here's a cross section of a leaf, okay, and you can see that we've got uh, two different kinds of mesophyll cells. We've got these tall, skinny ones called palisade mesophyll, and these shorter, clumpier ones that are that are loosely packed. So it's called the spongy mesophyll. There's a vein that carries the water and, and nutrients. And here we have in the lower surface and sometimes in the upper surface as well these uh, stomata, which are the openings, the pores that can get, can open and close uh, depending on how much water is present in the leaf to allow carbon dioxide to enter and oxygen to exit. Here we have a micrograph showing a mesophyll with the chloroplasts within the mesophyll cell. The chloroplasts are a double membrane envelope which enclose this inner compartment called the um, thylakoid space, filled, um, the inner compartment, excuse me, filled with a fluid called the stroma. That's kind of like the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. And there's also a system of interconnected membranes called thylakoids that are kind of like sac-like membranes that are stacked up in stacks. Remember uh, from earlier discussions that chloroplasts along with mitochondria uh, most likely have an endosymbiotic origin, meaning that they were, um, their ancestors were originally independent prokaryotes that were engulfed by and absorbed and became part of, became symbiotic with a larger cell at some time in the far distant past. The thylakoids are often stacked up in these little stacks called grana, 
Um, they have this internal compartment called the thylakoid space, which is very, very similar to the intermembrane space in the mitochondrion. And then they also have the structures, the chlorophyll and other molecules that convert light energy to chemical energy inside the, uh, inside the leaf. The chlorophyll molecules are, are part of the thylakoid membrane, and they're the parts that help capture the light energy that can be used to power these processes. Here's a diagram of chloroplast showing the outer and inner membrane and the stroma, which is the fluid-filled space around that. Then we have the stacks of thylakoid membranes, each of which has the thylakoid space in the middle. And all of those structures are important to the different processes that are occurring in the overall process of photosynthesis. This is a diagram. Here we have an actual micrograph, colored micrograph, that shows you what these look like in the actual, in the actual chloroplast. So you can see the stacks of grana. They're um, con interconnected with each other. And, um, contain all of the things necessary for the light-dependent de light reactions of photosynthesis, and the stroma has what's um, required for the light-independent reactions. There are two stages of photosynthesis, and they're linked by, by molecules ATP and NADPH. Now, we've talked about ATP before, adenosine triphosphate, which is the main energy currency of the cell. NADPH is an, an electron carrier molecule similar to the NADH we saw in cellular respiration. It's very easy to get these confused. The easiest way, I think, to remember which one belongs, belongs to which process is to remember that NADPH has a P in it, and the P stands for photosynthesis. It does basically the same type of job that NADH and FADH2 do in cellular respiration. The two stages of the, of the photosynthesis are the light reactions, or the light-dependent reactions, and the light-independent reactions. The light reactions occur in the thylakoid membranes themselves. In the process of these reactions, water molecules are split. The, that provides electrons for NATPH to carry. Oxygen is given off as a byproduct. We can generate ATP in the light reactions from ADP using some of that energy, light energy. The energy that is absorbed by the chlorophyll molecules allows the electrons and the hydrogen ions from the water to be added to or transferred to NADP plus to produce NADPH. And that provides electrons for the um, carbon fixation process that occurs in the Calvin cycle, which is the light independent phase of the photosynthetic reactions. The second stage of photosynthesis is the Calvin cycle, as I said previously. This occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast. And similar to what we saw in the Krebs cycle in cellular respiration, the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma because that's where the enzymes are located to catalyze this process. It is a cycle of reactions similar to what we saw with the Krebs cycle. And it assembles sugar molecules from carbon dioxide using the energy from NADPH and the ATP that is produced in the light reactions. Um, the carbon dioxide is, is put together into organic compounds. In this process, we call carbon fixation. Basically, we're making sugars. Okay? Enzymes in this cycle are going to further reduce the carbon compounds into sugars and uh, make the, the ultimate product, which we usually think of as glucose. Another name for the Calvin cycle is, is the dark reactions or the light independent reactions. That's because these steps in these, in these reactions do not require light itself. Um, the term dark reactions, in my opinion, is a misnomer because it has a tendency to make you think that it only occurs in the dark. And that isn't the case. It most often occurs in the light, although sometimes in the dark. But it just is called the light independent because it doesn't require light to occur. So here we have just a summary diagram to show the light strikes the thylakoid membranes where the light dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid membranes. We're going to take the water molecule that is one of the uh, inputs are one of the reactants of this process. We've also got NADPH and ADP. In the process of the light reactions, we're going to split the water molecule, releasing oxygen as a byproduct. 
we're going to use the electrons and hydrogen ions from the hydrogen to produce Na to reduce NADP plus to NADPH and to produce some ATP by means of a um, an electron transport chain similar to what we saw in um, cellular respiration. It, the ATP and the NADPH are going to be used to power the Calvin cycle in the stroma which will take the carbon dioxide uh, molecules from the air and be put together in a sequential fashion and eventually produce sugars. The ATP of course is reduced to ADP and integrated phosphate NADPH is oxidized to NADP plus and they recycle and are able to be used over and over again.